and welcome to Reliving My Youth. My name is Noel Fulton. My guest this week is Steve Fawcett. Now Steve is a founding member and original bassist of the band Heart. There for the first six albums with amazing songs as Crazy on You, Barracuda, Magic Man, Even It Up. All those amazing songs got the band inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2013, 30 years after Steve left the band. And we talked about just the awkwardness of the induction ceremony because they performed two songs. One of them was with the band that got inducted into the Hall of Fame. And the second song was with Hart's current band. So you can imagine just how awkward that part was. Steve is now in Heart by Heart with former Heart drummer Mike DeRozier and Steve's wife Summer, where they perform Heart songs the way they were meant to be. It is fantastic. They perform songs that Steve was part of the band, as well as songs that after Steve left, like Alone. And you know how on the show I always ask artists to remember where they were the first time they heard one of their songs on the radio. This might be my favorite story yet it is really really funny i hope you enjoy my conversation with steve as much as i did do um you have any plans uh to come to like new york and connecticut well not specifically i mean we all we have plans to go everywhere right yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah and we'd love to go everywhere offers right <laughs> yes we're just yeah. waiting for offers and you know i mean and right now it's it's really challenging because as you know heart is out doing an extensive yeah touring and uh they have this company i don't they're kind of big i don't what, what are they called oh live nation <laughs> yeah i may have heard of them they're like the <laughs> devil <laughs> yeah so that you know they're you know into heart and they're they're promoting yeah. heart and they're doing all that kind of stuff which is fine right I mean, they, they deserve it they you know oh yeah uh but you know heart by heart deserves it too because we we present the heart music in our own way which is totally valid totally right. good you know and we're you know i have a lot of faith in our band and i know i, it, I hate to toot our own horn but i no. i know that we're very we're very very good yeah, two to away. I mean, the clips I've seen online. I mean, if okay, if I'm gonna see, I'm not, I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. I think Summer sings the songs better now than Ann does. Well, and not taking anything wrong with Ann because Ann is no. one of the best singers of all time. But right yeah, now, Anne, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see Anne, your band. Yeah, Ann is <clears throat> is definitely she. She had the the voice, the mental capability, the skills, the knowledge, and she, without a doubt, is one of the best female singers to ever exist in the rock world. And hand it to her; she she's amazing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because I mean, I've seen clips now, and they've you know she they've kind of like you know change some of the songs and stuff like that and it's like you know making more medallies and you know this and that's like if i want to see like a particular song my favorite i want to see it authentic i don't want to see yeah. them, you know change it away I, I have a term like like sting sting changes songs all the time i call it he's stingified you know like every breath you take you know or, or stuff like that because he changed the song nine million times i don't want to hear you know like my favorite songs like nine different versions of it i just want to hear it how it was presented 20 30 years ago that's that's our mission when exactly. uh, mike and, and summer and i first met and decided to uh to take to, to do heart by heart seriously that's one of the things we said to each other is that we want to present the songs in a way that's going to create the nostalgia and love for the songs that people experienced when they first heard it 50 years ago or whatever how did um how did it start well, uh, Mike and Roger Fisher and I were, um, we hadn't played the heart material for a long time. <clears throat> and there was a party downtown in Seattle. And they wanted us to play a few heart songs. So, and, and of course, it was uh, Crazy on You, 
Magic Man Barracuda. And the person that was was chosen to sing for that you know semi reunion of the three of us was Summer. And uh, so that was the first time I met Summer, and I was impressed by her skills and her you know acumen as a person and and, and everything else. So we kind of became friends. And that was in February when we met. And then over the course of the rest of the spring, summer, and fall, we became closer friends. And then that friendship turned into a romance. And that romance uh, turned into a, a duo. It was a bass and vocals duo. And of course, we called it Heart by Heart because it's the two of us, Heart by Heart, together, you know, playing songs. And then uh, <clears throat> we got some offers to play some bigger shows. And we thought, well, let's. Instead of just being a duo, let's be a band. So we got uh, Mike. We asked Mike DeRozier to do it, and he said, "Fine." And then I don't know if you've ever heard of Randy Hansen. Okay. And he was uh, a good friend of ours, and he, we had him play, be the guitar player. And we had a little uh, combo, and it was really fun. And we, you know, started playing around Washington State, and then through our website, uh, booking agents on around the America heard about us, and then. All of a sudden, now we're playing. We started playing around the East Coast and the Midwest, and you know, just went from there. Yeah. Was it ever hard to kind of win over the crowd? Oh yeah, yeah, very hard because, especially in the beginning, you know, people would come um, look at us like, "Hmm, uh, let's see, are they, is she going to be able to sing this stuff or or what?" And then Summer starts singing, and they go, "Oh, no problem." And once they once they decide that the songs are being presented in a way that they can relate to, all that stuff just flies out the door and they just start having fun. And that's what we experience all the time now. Yeah, so everyone go on YouTube and check out uh, you know, Heart by Heart because there are some amazing clips on there. And you even play like songs that you weren't a part of in the band, like Alone, which uh, is, you know, is a great song and Summer knocks it out of the park too. What Was it um, like, kind of difficult picking songs that you weren't a part of the band? Well, not really, because um, we we understand that, you know, being a, uh, a band that's presenting the music of heart, I mean, there's our era, which obviously and, you know, critically and everything is the most acclaimed version of heart. But they had, they were very successful and they had some good, you know, songs in the, uh, the eighties too. And <clears throat> those songs are fun to play. And to tell you the truth, when that band was out playing, they played the music of our era. So we're going to play the songs of their era. Right. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. Was there, but yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, the songs are fun to play and there's a certain uh, segment of our crowd that just goes wild with those songs and they love to sing along and they get all excited and dance and everything. And so we, you know, we have fun with it too. Right. So that's going to tell you how I first discovered heart. Um, I was 10 years old. It was 1985. So I don't want to make you feel old or anything like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it was obviously, you know, you were out of the band for a couple of years and, you know, the self-titled album came out with, with the new band and what about love? It was the first single. Absolutely. Love is so Besides Crazy on You, my favorite heart song. Um, and I was in summer camp, sleepaway camp. And my counselor had a mixtape, which had like Pink Floyd on it, Rush. And a song came on and it was like, wow, this sounds like heart. And I had never heard it before. So I go to the counselor and ask what it was. And it was uh, Crazy on You. I'm like, wow, this is great. So we kind of, you know, bonded over heart. And I just discovered like the first six albums. But before that, I'm like, this is amazing. And I just like went and I was like 10 years old, couldn't wait to get home to, you know, get the rest of the cassette tapes and albums. And that's how I became like a fan, not only of the 85 album, but the previous six. Well, yes. I, I, I shouldn't say a private edition, sorry, but the other ones were <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you on that. <clears throat> yeah, the, the um, we were very lucky in the beginning. We had an excellent producer in Mike Flicker. And uh, we, you know, and he imparted his knowledge to us. And of course, uh, Mike Flicker and Howard Lease were partners at the time before we met them. And having Howard and Mike 
together, kind of teaching us the ropes and making sure that every recording and every second of every recording was perfect really helped out in the beginning. And one of the things he would say in the studio, you know, constantly was, okay, you guys, I want you to play this good today because you're going to be listening to it for the rest of your life. And we went, okay, that'd be nice. And it was true. Now I, I listen to it to this day. It's it's true. You really don't think about that, right? When, you, when you're recording that this is going to be something that's there for, for everybody here, for every, like once you record and send it out, it's not really your own anymore. It's everyone's in the world. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, you know, you hope that people like it and, it and it has staying power. But we had no idea the depth of the staying power that um, was created by those songs. Right. So how did, um like, first Anne and then Nancy get into the band? Well, uh, Raj and I had a couple of different versions of Heart back when we were in, living in the Seattle area. And um, you know how guys are, they <clears throat> they get disappointed and they um and first thing they want to do is quit. And you know, and a lot of people, Raj and I were partners and we shook hands when we were 17 years old and we said, okay, we're gonna make a band and we're not quitting until we make it big time. And two people like that in a band can be super annoying to the other people in the band that <laughs> maybe are not quite as ambitious, you know? Right. <laughs> and uh, so we, it was hard for us to, to, to get the other band members to be in, as enthusiastic as we were. So we put it, uh, so they quit. So it was just the two of us left. And, and when they quit, we, you know, Raj and I had some debts and blah, blah, blah. And we, and so, we we put an ad in the paper. We said, "Hey, we need a singer. We need another guitar player. We need a drummer." And uh, so we put an ad in the paper, and Ann Wilson was the one that answered the ad. And she had a friend that was a drummer, and we kind of ran into a guitar player. And then they also had another friend that was a male lead singer. So we had a male lead singer, Ann Wilson, a drummer, a guitar player, Roger, and myself. And we went out and we um, put together, you know, a, a bunch of uh, sets of cover material so we could play clubs. And we just started playing clubs in this Pacific Northwest area, you know, Portland, Idaho, uh, Washington State, of course. And then we got ourselves out of debt. And by that time, uh, Anne had proved herself to be as ambitious I say again, right? <laughs> as Roger and I, and she had uh, developed a relationship with Roger's older brother Mike, and Roger's older brother Mike was uh, living in Canada at the time, uh, you know, because he had went up there earlier to uh, escape the uh, the war, the the, the draft, basically. Right. So we kind of got together and we said, okay, we want to go to uh, Canada because at the time the American um, economy was kind of in the dumps because of the war and, you know, and, and people were unhappy with the war and there was all this, you know, back and forth, you know, about the war. And, but at the time the Canadian dollar was booming and it was one of the, one of the one of the few times in history when the Canadian dollar was actually worth more than the American. So we, the band that we put together with Anne in the summer of 1971 kind of ran its course by uh, December of 1971. We asked all the band, all the people in the band, if they wanted to, to go to Canada and start anew and they declined. So, uh, but Roger, Anne and myself, we emigrated to uh, Canada. And we were accepted as, as landed immigrants. And when we got there, we set about uh, forming a band in the lower <clears throat> British Columbia area. And we got a couple Canadian musicians. And before too long, we were one of the top acts in Vancouver. And we kind of had a really great reputation around Vancouver. And, that, and then we came to the attention of uh, Mike Flicker and Mushroom Records. They offered us a demo. They liked the demo. 
They talk to the money people. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got something in my throat. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> and the the uh, they they said, okay, yeah, well, you know, we'll finance a record for them, and that was Dreamboat Annie. And the rest, they say, is history. Yeah. <laughs> Were, were most of the songs written uh, already for Dreamboat Annie? Well, it was kind of, a, it was, uh, when we did our demo, it was kind of cover songs. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> but we, you know, we, we, they said, well, we want you to do, you know, a record. And said, well, we can't do a, a record of cover songs. So we started and we, you know, Hart and Roger and I and, we had always done our own songs, but we were mainly a cover band. So, but we start, you know, everybody kind of pooled all their knowledge and we came up with all these uh, songs for Dreamboat Annie. I mean, to say like, you know, you knocked it out of the park on your first album is an understatement. I mean, with some of those amazing songs, I mean, right off the bat, Magic Man, Crazy Under You, and of course, you know, the title track, Dreamboat Annie. I mean, it's, it's a hard act to follow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Magic Man was the very first song that I recorded for Dreamboat Annie. And uh, yeah, it's, and it's the first song on the album too. So it's something, it was really something else. And, you know, like I said a couple of minutes ago, I mean, Flicker did a great job. He really knew what he was doing. He knew how to, 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 uh, arrange the songs to get the most sonic benefit out of where they were placed on the the vinyl. That's why um, Magic Man opens up for side because with that Moog solo in there, to get that, those low rich notes, you had to have a lot of bandwidth and the, there was, there's not a lot of bandwidth when you get close to the inside. So you want as far out to the edges as you can get it. It, it's so like important. Like, I mean, I don't think it is anymore because people really don't listen to, you know, full length albums, but the track listing, the order of it is so important. Oh yeah. 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 It takes you on a musical journey and that's what, and that's, that's what uh, albums were back in the day. I mean, we would, uh, our favorite acts, we would go to the record store and we'd buy them and we'd mm -hmm. get home and we'd unwrap it and we'd all, imbibe in what we were ever going to imbibe in we turned the lights down low and we someone would set the, <laughs> the needle on the record and then we wouldn't speak until the whole thing was over and then and then we talk about it and we would you know and that was part of our philosophy was understanding and and realizing what it took to come up with parts that you people wanted to hear over and over again <clears throat> and you know and i don't know it, it, there were so many different bands at the time and so many bands that were successful and so many different you know kind of uh avenues of getting the record played nowadays <clears throat> wow i'm really sorry about that no, that's okay <laughs> Nowadays, it seems like they have the same or very similar musicians playing all the parts on all the songs. Right. I mean, in every genre, too. So, I mean, I'm not putting it down. I think there's a ton of great music coming out today. I love it. I listen to it. Uh, but they do kind of narrowly define what is good. And they do it over and over and over again, which is fine, which is fine. I'm not putting it down. Right. What it, I, I never put down success, but, uh, and I love it too. I mean, I listen to it. I, there's, I, I download music all the time that I like. So, and it's new music, old music. My favorite thing to download lately has been soundtracks, but uh, okay. that's another story. <laughs> right. Yeah. What, what kind of soundtracks? Cause I feel like soundtracks now are kind of like dead. You know, like the heyday really? of soundtracks. I mean, I'm not like not you know musical scores, but like actual like you know ones from like the 70s and the 80s where we're kind of like the heyday of like you know movie soundtracks. Yeah, yeah. Usually the, the soundtracks that I like the best are the ones that where they have a, a composer who composes music for that specific movie. Right. 
One of my favorite ones is the Mexican, you know, the one with Jeffrey okay, yeah. Pitt and uh, Julia Roberts. Roberts. Yeah. And then my recently I've uh, I watched the Gentleman. It's a Guy Ritchie. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, TV show on Netflix, and the soundtrack for that is freaking amazing. It's a uh, it's kind of uh, Carl Orff like in some ways and uh it's got you know it's fun to listen to and then right. i just like that kind of stuff and then of course that led me back to you know the marconi stuff uh and then the uh who's the godfather of uh of soundtracks would be uh can't think of his name right now, but he's super, you know, super famous. Yeah, I mean, there's like you know John Williams and like Hans Zimmer and you know those guys. Yeah, I'm thinking even further back than that. Back, the guy, okay. King Kong. And, oh, wow. uh, okay. <laughs> and Treasures of the Sierra Madre, and, and uh, I can't think of his name right now. I'm really sorry. Oh, that's okay. I yeah. could look it up for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <work>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's funny you hold that up and you know um this this technology now where it's you can basically stream any song you can have your whole collection on your phone what are your thoughts about like streaming i mean as being an artist i mean you, you get nothing but people can access your music you know at the drop of a hat so it's got to be a kind of a double-edged sword for like artists i love it <laughs> <laughs> I love it because there's an entity. I don't, have you ever heard of Sound Exchange? Yeah. So they keep track of downloads and streams and radio airplay and, and you know, and uh, then they send you a check every month. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, for some reason, for some reason, which I can't really put pinpoint, but heart. Is, you know, classic, not, not just heart, but classic music from that era is one of the most popular uh, streams and downloads and all that kind of stuff to this day. And uh, I'm very, we're very fortunate and happy that it's, that's part of it. But, uh, you know, that's well-deserved too. I mean, it, I mean, who doesn't want to hear, you know, Tom Petty, Led Zeppelin, right. you know, Pink Floyd, you know, Heart stones i mean that was the the stuff that you know where the innovation happened every day and there was you know and bands had a, a certain identity and they had certain musicians that had created their sound and that sound you just you can't reproduce yeah. it uh, max steiner the composer max steiner that's yeah. the guy yeah he did how did you how, how'd you come up with that <laughs> yeah. yeah but he, yeah, so he also he, did Casablanca and stuff like that too yes yeah. I mean he was he was the guy that that opened up the world of sound uh, soundtracks and we haven't looked back since you know there's the Newmans the you know all that kind of stuff and it's it's beautiful music yeah and it's it's not you know it's not like a symphony like Beethoven's Fifth or anything like that but it they have little vignettes that ex express so much in, you know, 30 seconds. Yeah. And it'd be hard to watch some of these movies without music. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. So how did, um, like, opening up a Farad student faces in Montreal come about? Well, we were, <clears throat> it's a good story to that. We were playing a club in uh, Calgary, Alberta. <clears throat> and I just... Uh, so Anne and Nancy were on Kelly Clarkson yesterday and they told the story. Okay. And uh, we did not get along with the club owner and the club owner thought we were rubbish. <laughs> you guys are rubbish. <laughs> so we played Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday night. He said, he came to us and said, you know what? It's just not working out. You guys, I'm going to have to let you go where I got another band for the weekend. And so we were like, what? So, cause we'd never been, fired ever hmm. so we were kind of like uh. and that's just uh when mike and uh <clears throat> howard had just joined the band at that point and they looked at us like what the hell you guys you just get us in your band and we get fired and uh 
so we go kind of go home with our tail between our legs or not home, but back to the hotel. <clears throat> so we're all kind of at the hotel, giving each other side eyes and everything like, what the hell is happening, you know? And uh, we get a call and it was the record company saying, Hey, is there any way you guys can get out of the plan this weekend? We said, well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, they said, good, because you're going to open up for Rod Stewart and the Faces in Montreal and Toronto. So we want you to pack everything up and we're going to put you on a train tomorrow morning. You're going to go across uh, Canada on the Scenic Cruiser, which right. was an awesome experience. I mean, I have highly suggest it. It's very, very nice. And it, we happen to have some nice weather and everything. So it was really beautiful. We get to Montreal, you know, and we sleep. Uh, overnight we get up in the morning and howard mike and i go out and we have crepes as you and, do in montreal <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh you know we went shopping i went shopping at a uh uh a thrift type store with clothing and that's where i bought that famous green vest you know the one that's kind of like a bustier for yeah <laughs> and i still have it to this day and uh it's people have there's been a lot of comments about that vest. <laughs> <Right. all years. laughs> and so we played the show that night and, you know, we, we didn't know what to ex expect really because we had no idea how much airplay um, Hart was getting around the country and all that kind of stuff. And this is just in Canada, right? Cause we had that Canadian content thing going. Right. And <clears throat> the one thing about those pesky radio waves is they, they don't stop at the border. They don't know that there's a border. Right. So they keep going right into America. Yep. I, I went to college up in Buffalo. So I discovered a ton of, you know, Canadian music that way, which was yeah. great. Yeah. So uh so we so we do our sound check for the show and we're we're all excited and everything. And we get on stage and and I say, hey, ladies and gentlemen, heart. And there's kind of a you know, polite yeah. applause. So we play Magic Man. And the place went, that was our first song. And the place went nuts. And it was like, you know, it's 15, 18,000. It was their hockey arena, right? Right. And I looked out and everybody had their lighters on. You remember that? Yep. <laughs> lighters and applause and clapping. And, and we all, and I looked out and I went, okay, that's it. We're, We're here. <laughs> we've made it. Yep. <laughs> this is it. And uh, the rest of the show was, was, really well received and uh and a couple of days later we opened up for for them in toronto too same experience so we knew something was going on and we were all happy about it did that boost the sales of dream one Addy? oh yeah. yeah oh yeah it certainly did and that was but at the time it was just released in canada okay <clears throat> but very you know soon after that we made arrangements for it to be uh, released in America. And uh, so during that year, we <clears throat> kind of did, we opened up for some, you know, other acts like uh, ZZ Top and, okay. and the Bee Gees and not quite, not quite as huge as, you know, Rod Stewart was at the right. time, but uh, still really fun and, and uh, interesting. And, uh, so after after Christmas, we kind of talked to our accountants and everything. Says, "Well, we, we love Canada. We kind of want to stay here." And they said, "Well, that's fine. You can stay mm -hmm. in Canada, but you're going to be paying income tax for Canada and America." Right. So, but if you go to America, you just have to pay American taxes. So we said, "Bye bye." <laughs> I vote we'd go back to America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we got back to America, and by March we. Uh, had released uh, Dreamboat Annie in America and we started, you know, touring and, you know, we opened up for every act you can think of that was popular back in 1976. Yeah. And we did, you know, uh, Ken Kinnear, our manager at the time, he did a great job of getting us in front of the maximum amount of people. And then wherever we went, uh, the record company, it was kind of a fly by night record company. Not 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 that it was bad, but right. it was it didn't have the network that like say CBS Records or right. or the big record companies had. Yeah. So 
they would look at our schedule and they go, okay, we better get some albums in, in to St. Louis because they're going to play St. Louis pretty soon. So they yeah. would figure out a way to get the albums there. And then uh, they, and it kept working, you know, then we'd sell a bunch. And, and then finally they, um, they, they got Kmart. Remember Kmart? Oh, yes. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> and once you got Kmart, I mean, Kmart had stores everywhere. Yeah. And they, you know, and they bought like truckloads of, <laughs> of records. And all of a sudden yeah. it went from gold to platinum to double platinum, you know, just really quickly. And then we all just went <laughs> high five yeah, on our way. So it was really fun. Right. Now the, the cover of Dream Boy Annie, it's it's very, you know, beautiful cover, but it just has the sisters on it. Were you guys kind of like annoyed about that? Um, I would say, let me think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we had no choice because we, you know, we did the album and uh, everybody was okay. And we had no idea what was going on with the cover, and then all of a sudden they, one day we were at the studio doing something and they came in, hey, hey, here's the cover. It's like, what? Right. And, uh, but the, uh, I guess the record company had, they, they felt that they needed to emphasize the girls. They thought that was a, a great yeah. way to go. And, but, and, you know, you opened up the record and there was all kinds of pictures of the guys in there. So, yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, like, I kind of miss those days. I mean, I know vinyl is kind of back now, but just the liner notes, the pictures, see who worked on, you know, the production of the album. You don't get that now with streaming. No. Yeah. You know, it's and what I found too is that you even have a hard time figuring out who wrote the songs because, I mean, they used to list that on, yeah. in albums. Right. Who who wrote this, who played this, exactly. you know, what day it was recorded, everything. Yep. All that information was there. Nowadays, it's like you have to, you know, really research it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the, I guess the unofficial, I mean, I don't know how you would classify magazine, which I really, really enjoy with some great songs on there, but there was a lot of headaches with that production, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause <laughs> so what, like I was saying back in 76 when we were out touring, so they'd send us out for two, three weeks, you know, and we'd, drag ourselves around all over the place and we were in a van at the time and and sometimes a bus and sometimes an airplane but it was tiring and then they said okay you got you got a week off you know so they send us we go back home to uh, Vancouver at the time and we you know oh sit back and get some sleep and then we get a call hey uh, you're booked at the studio tomorrow, 9 a.m., blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> and that was that's how Magazine was recorded. So that's where we did Magazine and uh, Heartless, uh, Devil's Delight, yeah. all those songs that came about in between the, the tours of promoting Dream Bone Annie. So we were doing that. And, and then it, and at the time, we had uh, recorded some live uh, a live radio broadcast from one of our favorite clubs down here in Seattle. And, uh, and then we started having um, issues with mushroom records because they were kind of uh, patronizing to us, okay. you know, you know, instead of, you know, cause the record contract says, okay, you sell so many records in this amount of time. And then, so much later, you're, they were supposed to hand over the, the funds. And they said, well, don't worry about the funds. Whatever you need, we'll take care of it. Right. Kind of like Colonel Parker type yeah, attitude. Okay. Right. And uh, we said, no, no, we're not doing it. So all that year, 1976, from March until December, you know, so we ended up touring America, Canada, and then we ended up in Europe in December. Every member of, of the band, even though we had a double platinum Dreamboat Annie, we were all, all making $200 a week. Wow. Because we didn't want to, we didn't want to accept their, you know, they, yeah. we didn't want to say, because they were saying, well, how much money do you need? We'll just write you a check. Right. We'd say, well, 
what we need is for you to do the accounting and give us the what the accounting says were due. And it was, you know, yeah. just went on and on and on. And so what ended up happening was we, that kind of gave us a loophole to get out of the mushroom records thing. And, and by that time, the, the big record companies that we'd been yeah. after in the beginning came and they said, Oh, well, gosh, I guess you guys are pretty good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so they kind of there was kind of a, a a bidding war for us and we ended up you know going with uh, columbia records which the division of that was portrait and that's where um little queen came out on <clears throat> but in the meantime mushroom records unbeknownst to us mixed and put out magazine right. well when we, we saw that we went hey well, what's going on yeah we didn't approve that right so back and forth back and forth and we ended up cutting a deal with them where we would mix and and uh, you know pretty up all the songs you know in, you know the way we want them presented and they can re-release but only after we do Little Queen okay <clears throat> after we release Little Queen but so that's what happened right so technically magazine was album number two but yeah. but legally it ended up being number three right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Either way, I mean, it's, I mean, the title, I know I love, yeah, I love magazine. magazine. Oh, I it's such a great that. song. Yeah. I love that album. And I love all the playing because what happened was, okay, Dreamboat Annie was kind of like, okay, we'd bring in Howard here for this. And then we had different drummers besides Mike play on different songs. Right. That was before Mike actually officially joined the band. But magazine was the one where we had all been playing together for, you know, touring and, and all that kind of stuff. So we had a feel for each other. And that's that's where magazine, right. um, Heartless, Devil Delight, that yeah. where that stuff came came from. Right. And I this song gets covered so much, Bad Fingers Without You. And it's your version's great. And it's like and does such an amazing job and she knocks it out of the park with that version. Yeah. Yeah. We uh we know what we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Now, like, how important is that? Because, you know, you, you always say you have, like, your whole life to record your first album and then, you know, six months to do your second one. But you guys were on tour and you guys, you mentioned, were like a well-oiled machine. So how important is that being on tour before, you know, and performing these songs before you actually go out and record, like, your follow-up album? Yeah, it it, it is important. And because you develop a rapport with the, the the rest of the musicians in the band and you, and just by playing together and having that intimate contact you you know what who does what and what to expect from this musician and and how to fit your parts all, all in together so they make sense and and you know cuz ensemble playing is not just five people just playing whatever the whatever they want it's everybody kind of agreeing but not you know not saying you play this and you play right. that well it's everybody kind of understanding what their role is and playing you know what fits with this and what fits with that and me being a bass player you know I'm a, okay think of it this way okay so i'm working with a great drummer right Two great guitar players, Howard Leeson, Roger Fisher, another great guitar player, and Nancy Wilson, and and then Ann Wilson, and you don't want to step on any of them, but you do want to make up a part that's interesting and fun to play and right. fits what's going on. So I had a big challenge. And uh, you know, through my youth, I had really delved into what what role a bass player player can can play in either adding to the song or being playing in a way that is distracting that takes away from the song so i didn't want to be a distraction but i wanted to be a positive influence on everything and i think i achieved that yeah i, I totally agree how, how did you know when to do that when to contribute well, it it was something that I just learned and 
understood from the very beginning because, you know, okay, one of my biggest influences when I first started playing was, of course, Paul McCartney. Right. And he, you know, he had a way of playing very interesting parts, but they didn't, they didn't distract from the song. They added to it. And then another one of my big influences was Bill Wyman. Okay. And, you know, and he was very stoic in his presentation, but he, you know, he ended up playing some incredibly, you know, compelling bass parts. And then, of course, uh, John Paul Jones came along and it's like, holy moly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why couldn't I have been born in England? Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now I want to jump ahead, I guess, a couple albums. Uh, Maybe a little strange, which I guess is the fifth album. And um, Even It Up is like one of my favorite songs. Um, just the, like, that point was everything just kind of like, you know, autopilot for you guys? Well, I not really. Not really. Okay. I mean, you try everything you do, you try to put, you know, your soul into, especially at that time. And uh, so with Even It Up, um, Anne decided she wanted to be like Paul McCartney and play too so she ended up playing the bass on that one okay and but i'd been playing it the bass for (laughs) for all the you know demos and uh live performances that we did she kind of but whatever i mean she did a great job so i mean how like was there a lot of like kind of like politicking in, in the band during those days was it hard yeah that's as soon as raj left the band the politicking kind of started being showing its uh you know its head Mm -hmm. and you know and the uh the ladies they understood that if they wrote a song with us in the room there's a chance we could go hey you know i came up with you get credit and they might go and we they might have to share right yeah and that was some people have a hard time sharing yeah it's yeah it's kind of funny how like in the mid 80s on they didn't write any of those songs that were so successful exactly yeah, yeah they they want part of the deal with signing with capital was that they wanted them to work with you know songwriters right and you know Anna and Nancy touched on that yesterday and there was a bevy of songwriters that were popular at the time and that everybody was choosing songs from and, and they got on that band like which is fine I mean right. success is success and you know and Howard and 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 uh Anne were basically the driving forces of the uh, music, in my opinion, for those for that era. So, yeah. Yeah. so you and Mike left after private audition. Did you guys leave on your own? Were you forced out? And what happened with that album? Well, we were asked to leave. And, okay. You know, we were happy to leave at the time because the politics of the band were it was just too much. Yeah. Just had to roll your eyes and just go, what, the, you know, why, yeah. why, why, why do people act like this? Right. You know, and I'm not saying that we were perfect, but with private audition, you know, Mike and I were, were, uh, we wanted the band to, to take up a, a, a rock, more rock attitude, some, the kind of stuff that people were, had come to, expect from heart right and we wanted to you know because there there are you know the songs we did on dream but annie like mac Mac, magic man crazy on you were come see songs you know oh i want to see him play that one live. right and of course on uh little queen there was same thing barracuda being yeah you know so 
and we kind of want to continue that 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 feel but Anna and Nancy wanted to take it in a different direction and they were both fairly distracted by you know, life okay as they say right okay hmm. was that the last time you saw them before you got inducted into the hall of fame decades later well no nah, we you know um Anne and I were, especially in the early days, were fairly good until she met Mike Fisher. We were fairly good friends, and we right. we talked and hung out and joked and yeah. had fun and you know whatever. We weren't you know I wouldn't I wouldn't call in anything close to romantic, but you know we were good friends. Right. And uh, you know, and I'm sure she respected me, and I respected her, and we had a good relationship. But then once people get into a relationship. You know, it's hard. It you can't really have friends, with, especially in the beginning, with the opposite sex, basically. So yeah. we kind of we still appreciated and liked each other, but you know, she was busy being a uh, you know girlfriend, partner with someone else. Now, tell me about how you found out about the Hall of Fame. I mean, because that was 2013, I remember, right? And it was, I guess it was like. 30 years after leaving the band. So just tell me how you found out about it. Okay. So we were actually nominated the year before in 2012. Right. And um, I was, I hadn't heard, you know, I really hadn't thought about it too much. I, you know, cause I just thought there's no way that heart's going to get, you know, in there. Cause the heart, the hall of fame didn't even exist when we first started. Right. Didn't even exist. So, uh, I as I was in a relationship with Summer at the time, and she had a day job, so I dropped her off at work. I was driving, and she had an apartment, and I was going back to my house. And I was driving down the road, and on came uh, owner of Lonely Heart. Okay. And Alan White lived in Seattle, and he was a good friend of ours. And Alan was, he, <laughs> he could see how Summer and I felt about each other. And he kept saying, don't let this one go, Steve. <laughs> she's, she's pretty cool. Don't, you know, all this kind of stuff. And of course I followed his advice. Right. But uh, so I was driving home and I, I was pulling up to the stoplight at, the, at kind of a busy intersection. And, uh, and one of the long heart came on and then, the, and the guy and the DJ says, uh, speaking of heart, Hart was nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame today. And I went, what? The what? <laughs> Why? And, you know, I didn't know what that meant at the time, right. the nomination. So I, I just about drove off the road. I mean, I swear to God, it was it was dangerous. Yeah. And, oh, I got to put the brake on to stop now. <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. So it was kind of weird. But so I got home and I started getting phone calls and I made some phone calls and you kind of figure out what, Oh, it's just nomination. It's not, right. you're not in, it's yeah. nomination. You go through a whole vetting process after that. And <clears throat> that whole year I was on pins and needles. <laughs> I, mean, I couldn't sleep, but couldn't, you know, everything was. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, and we didn't, we weren't not nominated to uh, go to be an inductee that year. So that was kind of disappointing, but, you know, I thought, eh, you know, it was an honor to be nominated. Right. You know, that's a step in the right direction. Uh, so we were not, we were not chosen to, to be inducted that year, <clears throat> you know, and, and so we went on and then they announced the 2013 inductees and we were amongst that class. And I went, Okay, that's good. And I was, I just let it go. I just, right. said, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, there's nothing I can do about it. And so I just kind of forgot about it. And I, like, unlike the previous year when I was totally focused on that, you know, the whole time, this year I, I just, I was just living my life just the way I live it and just right. going on with life. So I was downstairs, uh, fooling around with my bass and my amp and, and uh, I was in my <laughs> dorky, you know how it is when you're mm -hmm. home and you you wear your dorky, comfortable 
clothes of and course. all that. Yeah. So I was just down there, you know, shuffling around, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I got a phone call and it was somebody from the Hall of Fame. They said, Well, you're in. So I said, In what? Right. Oh, you're going to be inducted this year into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I went, <laughs> And I couldn't talk. I couldn't right. talk. I was, uh, but, <laughs> I, uh, you know, <laughs> And I was, you know, I was very pleased and excited to be, uh, to be chosen, you know, and, you know, once, and then once you get chosen, then all this process start, starts of understanding what being chosen meant. So I didn't, you know, I didn't understand that they were just choosing the original band from the 70s, 70s. to be inducted. Yeah. Because you know, because the other, you know, the '80s version had some some success. Right. They continued continued the legacy, but uh, for some reason, the rock and roll fame didn't call, care about that band so much. Maybe they will in the future. Who knows? So we just, you know, we just went about our lives and figured out. Mm. Well, okay, April eighteenth, we're going to. Yeah. Los Angeles, we're going to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And so, and then all these politics stuff yeah. that goes on. That's like, oh my God. So, <clears throat> you know, and then because you don't know, well, are are we going to play or right. are, are they going to let us on stage mm -hmm. or, you know? Yeah. But it worked out. So they, we, we, they called us all up on stage. And we were allowed to play, but we were only allowed to play. Once on you. Yep. Yeah. We couldn't play Barracuda, and it's, which is kind of odd because Roger Fisher, original guitar player, yeah. like DeRozier, original drummer, are co-writers of Barracuda. Right. Why wouldn't they want the co-writers of Barracuda to play on Barracuda for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on yeah. one of the biggest nights in Hearts history, period. Right. But uh, so they had their version, yeah, version of heart, and you know, and here's another sidebar to that. Over the course of since Mike and I left the group, there's been sixty different musicians that have cycled in and out, of right? Them, called themselves heart in heart. the meantime, and, and we're going like, boy, oh boy, yeah. It's a lot of musicians. <clears throat> yeah. And like the current version who was on there weren't even in the the 80, mid eighties band, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. So and so here's a little sidebar. Uh so you know, Dave Grohl, he uh, inducted Rush. Right. And and we just got through playing and, and Mike and was backstage and he was with Dave. And they were, you know, and they were kind of, hey, oh, way to go, that sounded really good, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then they, you know, Hart started Barracuda and Dave Grohl, who, you know, of course, is drummer. Yeah. He goes, it's slow. It's slow. What, what are they doing? It's it's too slow. And Mike thought the same thing and said the same thing. And they looked at each other like, oh, what's going on here? And it was kind of, you know, a semi-disaster, but. Yeah. I guess there's some people that think it's good. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's difficult. You're inducting the seventies version, have the seventies version perform all the songs. That's the band that yeah. is there. Yeah. But... You know, and you know, and Cantrell was there with us and McCready yeah. and, uh, and uh, there's Cornell Cornell. That's right. Yeah. And for some reason they wanted them on stage and it's like, and it's like, Oh, well, because wow. I was talking, during rehearsals, I was talking with uh, Cantrell. Yeah. And he goes, I don't even know why I'm here. <laughs> you, I mean, what I'm playing doesn't even, I mean, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. I mean, you guys have it down. Yeah. But it was fun. You know, Jerry's a great guy and he's fun to hang out with. So, but it was, you know, we had a, he stood on my side of the stage. So we had a nice report. That's good. It was right. fun. He's, he's a good guy. Good. Good. Was there any like, communication between you and the sisters during the whole uh, thing? well not a lot you know um during the rehearsal the day before you know of course that's the first time we actually seen them for in a long time you know and it was 
cordial, yeah. but not anything other than that. And uh, it was kind of weird. But the very first time we played Breezy on You Together, you, it should have been recorded because it was absolutely perfect. It was like right. riding a bike. We all just got up there. Psh. Okay, next. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Was there ever like a thought in like your mind, maybe Mike's mind, Rogers, that this could, you know, go somewhere after the uh, induction ceremony? Well, we wanted it to because it was a great opportunity to capitalize on the, you know, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yeah. version. Right. Of, uh, and uh, <clears throat> the, no takers on that. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> In that camp. Right. I, I guess you probably saw the writing on the wall when you guys couldn't do Barracuda, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Was there anyone that night, like, because obviously there's so many, you know, amazing musicians and celebrities there that you basically had to meet? Well, you know, we, uh, in the early days, like when I was telling you about 1976, well, one of the um, the bands that let, them, let us open up for them was Rush. And we opened up for them in Detroit and St. Louis. Right. And which was very, you know, very nice of them to let us, allow yeah. us to do that for them. And, you know, and it, and it helped, you know, helped us uh, along in our careers, you yeah. know. So we had that connection with Rush. And, you know, of course, and Rush was Canadian and, and we at the time we were Canadian too. Hmm. And we had that, we both had that connection and I don't know, it was, uh, it was, it was really nice to, you know, catch up with uh, Alex and Getty and say hi again and be, you know, and be inducted together. It, it's a, you know, yeah. great people to have in our class with us. Yeah, totally. They're, they're, I love them too. They're such a great, great band. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you remember where you were the first time you heard one of your songs on the radio? I know exactly where I was. <laughs> would you like to hear the story? I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> Anne and Nessie both said their story yesterday and they were okay. driving. And they heard it on the car radio. Right. But uh, so we were playing a club in Vancouver, British Columbia, <clears throat> Starving Marvins. Hmm. And we were told during, before the night was over, that the next day, a certain radio station in Vancouver was going to play Magic Man. And I thought to myself, okay, I've been playing my bass since I was 15 years old. Never heard myself on the radio. I want to hear myself on the radio for the very first time. Right. So I made special note of this radio station and all that kind of stuff. So I, I get up in the morning, turn on the radio, and I heard every band that was popular in the day you could think of. Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Stones, Beatles, Doobie Brothers, everybody. Mm -hmm. Every band you can think of. No heart. So I thought to myself, well, did I get the wrong radio station? What, what's what's the matter here? And I said, well, maybe they meant tomorrow right. or some other day. So I'm, I'm I'm looking at the clock. I'm going, hmm, I got to get ready because we were playing in the club that night. So, I, you know, of course, you want to take a shower or whatever. <laughs> so I turn the radio up, go, go back, turn on the shower. Jump in with one ear, mm -hmm. listening for the radio. As soon as I get wet from head to toe, bam, it's on the radio. So I didn't even turn the water off. I just uh, jumped out of the bathtub. Didn't even grab a towel. I ran down right. the hallway, water flying everywhere. Stood in the middle of the living room, turned the radio up even more, and listened to myself for the very first time, soaking naked, and soaking wet, dripping water <laughs> all over the place. Right. But I got goosebumps then, and I got I'm having goosebumps right now thinking yeah. about it. Wow, uh, that's great. And I, of course, Magic Man, it's not a short song. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a two minute, two and a half right. minute song. It's yeah. 
it's got guitar solos it's got moog solos it's got you know yeah so but you know it was it was uh yeah i loved it i loved right. it. it's a great uh and I, i'll never forget it so it's a great way to that's it first time i heard myself on the radio yeah that's that, that's great i i always ask my guests that question i think that's probably a top top three response that's awesome um yeah so heart by heart uh websites heart by heart by dot com um you got a show coming up next week right yes in uh millville new jersey okay is that right, is that right? um i think so yeah that's kind yeah, of cause... yeah the levoy, levoy theater i think oh levoy we call yeah. it levoy 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 okay yeah <laughs> But yeah, I mean, and we've had great communication with the theater and they sound like they're, they're really excited about us coming and we're excited about going there. And uh, it's kind of an unusual usual thing to have a show on a Thursday night, but that's what happens. So, Right. Yeah. Well, hopefully you'll get some offers for New York and Connecticut down the road because I'd love to yes. See, yes. see you guys. And But see, this was fantastic. Um, best of luck with with everything going forward and hopefully i'll see you soon thank you Noel. appreciate uh, you talking and a special thanks to steve for joining me today go check out their website heartbyheart.com they're amazing go and Go on YouTube and check out some of the clips. If you can't see them in concert, they're really, really good. And if you have a guest suggestion, you can hit me up on X, formerly Twitter, at the first one 019 or like the page, We're Living My Youth on Facebook. You can go to iTunes, check out all the past episodes we've had. While you're there, please rate and review the show. I would really appreciate it. If you don't have iTunes, not a problem. Shows on SoundCloud, Spotify, Podbean, Amazon Music, YouTube, basically wherever you can find a podcast. And we're really coming close to our seventh anniversary show. I have a really special guest for that. Stay safe, everybody. We'll see you then.